It's great to see all of you here this morning on this Resurrection Sunday, and we welcome those of you who are online as well and watching us, and we encourage you, come on back. Come on back. We're here. You know, this morning, I got up early at sunrise and, and went to our campus in Bentonville, and as I've done for every building that we've built since 1989 on the Easter before it's open. I go there and I have my own little worship service and, and just thinking about what it'll be like up there next year for them. And, and it will open the door for so many more people to be reached in Northwest Arkansas. And right now they're at Orchards Park in Bentonville. All the Bentonville folks are gathered worshiping together. So lots of incredible things are happening. April 12th of last year was a sad, sad day for me as I came to this campus and there was no one here. That was Easter Sunday last year. And I know we were worshiping virtually and all that, but you know, for over half my life, I've been here at Fellowship. And since 1990, I've shared every Easter celebration with you. And so I am thrilled to be back this year to be able to celebrate Easter live in these services. And again, welcome to those of you who are online. Yeah, you know, many of you over the last year, our elders last year canceled the services because of, of our concern for you and for our staff. Many of you have lost loved ones to the COVID virus. And I just want to take a moment, uh, if we could just have a moment of silence and remember those who have lost their lives over the last year. Could we do that right now and just honor them? Oh, Lord, we honor those who have lost loved ones. We honor those families. And we ask you to give them comfort in their deepest sorrow. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, there's no resurrection without death, is there? In this Holy Week, we honor the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Death is a word that haunts us. It keeps us up at night. Especially as you get older. Every time you go to the doctor to, to get a pathology report or just an appointment or, or a, a lab test or, or any of that, you, you wonder, is this the time that I'm going to hear I've got the big C or heart disease or there's the whole list of things you might have. Death is, is a cruel tormentor. It chases us around all of our lives, and, and we worry about that time when we'll have to deal of it. And some of you are dealing with it right now. And I, I want to tell you, some of the people in our body that I pray for daily who are dealing with difficult situations, you and inspire and encourage me through your attitude. It is, it's the scripture lived out that God will give you the peace that transcends all understanding and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So it is true. We don't have to be anxious for anything, but it worries us. This past week, 36-year-old Alex Burris, a part of our church family, went to be with the Lord after a long struggle with cancer. He has a wonderful wife and two boys aged four and seven. My daughter worked with Alex. And when I sent her an email that Alex had passed on to be with the Lord, she said, oh no, this is a sad day. He is one of the kindest people I've ever known. His wife, the day after his passing, wrote this. She said, Alex is with Jesus. I am broken. The pain I have felt over the last four days has been almost unbearable. But I've told Alex many times that if I could take his pain away, I would have. And I guess that is what this is. I am in pain and he is healed. I am broken and he is whole again. It's a pain I will carry with honor. Yesterday, I woke up with such a sense of peace because I realized that for four years, four years, he battled cancer. Four years, our path options were total healing or more treatments, pain and suffering. And now our options were miraculous healing or being fully restored in heaven. Either way, 
Alex is free from this disease and free from the pain. And that is all I ever wanted. And then she wrote, I love you, babe. The attitude of this family in the midst of their suffering was incredible. They communicated with the elders for prayer like no one else we've ever prayed for. They let us know every step of the way how we could be praying. He lost the battle, but he didn't lose the war. And what is the cause of death? It's sin. It's sin. It's another word that haunts us. It destroys lives. It devastates families. It's a cruel and unforgiving tormentor. The Greek word for sin is a term for archery. It literally means to miss the mark. It's missing the mark of God's best for us. It's the reason that Christ came and died on the cross on our behalf. All of God's wrath for sin was satisfied through Jesus' death on the cross. That's why Isaiah wrote, it pleased God to crush him. Sin is the reason we experience death. Paul wrote about this in Romans 5. He said, sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people. As Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, he made an ominous statement to those who are arresting him. And it explains so much about this crazy world we live in. In Luke 22, he says, why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there every day. But I want you to listen to this, what he said next. But this is your moment. The time when the power of darkness reigns. This is your moment, the time when the power of darkness reigns and sin has been reigning ever since. The prince of the power of the air, Satan, reigns. It's the overarching problem in this troubled world in which we live. The power of sin and darkness, yes, this is Satan's hour. Unless we think it was just that moment in the garden that Jesus was talking about, look what Paul says in Ephesians 6. He says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So it wasn't just that moment in the garden that Jesus was referring to. We have a powerful enemy working against us every moment, every day, and it will be that way until Jesus comes. So when you wonder, what is going on in this world of ours? How could everything be so out of whack? It's because of sin. And the only answer is the love of Jesus. Let's look at God's attitude towards sin for just a moment. Since sin leads to death. Romans 2, 5, and 8. Sin is judged harshly by God. Paul says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Sin is judged harshly by God. He takes it very seriously. If somebody says, I know it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway, they're factoring out something very important that we should consider. They're factoring out that one day we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We will all stand before God. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I share that with people often who are making choices of willful disobedience, that they're factoring out one thing, that judgment will come for all of us. The second thing is sin is unmanageable. 
We think we can manage it. We think we can just dabble in it here or dabble in it there. But sin is unmanageable. Look what James says. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. You can't manage sin. I'm just going to do this much. You see what Satan will do? He'll give you a line, just like a fish. He'll let you run with it. And you think you're just running free, running free. But when you're most vulnerable and when it will do the most damage, he sets the hook. So don't think you can just run, run, run. Do your own thing. And Satan's desire, sin is used by Satan to disrupt and destroy lives. He uses sin to do that. 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. My millennial friends who think that Satan is bound right now, I don't think so. I don't think he's bound. Like the old song says, he's alive and well on the planet Earth. He will destroy you and everything you hold dear by way of your sin. And then sin yields collateral suffering. Sin yields collateral suffering. Poor choices yield detrimental consequences for those in our sphere of influence. Willful disobedience isn't just between you and God. You say, I'm not hurting anybody else. No. There's collateral suffering in the body of Christ among your co-workers, your friends, and most certainly your family. Scars are formed that never heal when we make choices of willful disobedience. I recently read an article by a lady named Jen Wilkin in Christianity Today, and she said it so well. She said, we instinctively divide our sins into two categories, those that affect our neighbor and those that affect only us. The ancient God of individualism whispers that some sins are just between God and me. If there are consequences, they will impact only me. And this is simply not true. The consistent message of the Bible is this. Personal sin yields collateral suffering without fail. How true. The ripple effects of sin in the life of a Christian cast a far wider net of destruction than we might, than we might imagine. As the body of Christ, there's a bond between all of us that is disrupted when willful disobedience occurs in the life of a believer. Remember Achan in the story of Joshua. He took those things that were devoted to destruction and it had affected the entire, the entire nation of Israel. I bet when he stole those things, he had no idea that his family would die. Collateral sin yields suffering. And then the last one, sin changes the one who chooses to willfully disobey God. Willful disobedience changes you. It's called grace abuse. It's called a loophole. You think I'll just take this exit over here and I'll go sin and dabble in this for a while and then I'll just come back and pick up where I left off. No, that's not the way it works because it will change you. You may not be able to come back or what's worse, you may not want to come back because sin will change you. Paul writes to the Romans, in Romans 6, he said, what shall I say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And he said, by no means. In the old King James Version, he says, God forbid. God forbid that we would practice grace abuse, that we would use the loopholes that we might think we found in God's grace. God forbid. But here's the good news. Christ came. Christ came and paid the price for our sin. He died so that we might have victory over sin. We aren't left powerless and without hope. We have a living hope. And we can say no to sin that leads to death. 
At Titus, Paul writes, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager, eager to do what is good. We can live in freedom because of the death and resurrection of Christ. He is risen. Absolutely. And we should proclaim that to everyone. We live in an age of grace where Christ has taken all of our sins and he says he cast them as far as far as the east is from the west in Psalm 103. He cast them as far as the east is from the west and remembers them no more. Micah says that he sinks them to the bottom of the sea and puts up a sign that says no fishing. He puts them away. He forgets our sin through Christ who paid the price. Say this with me. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say it again. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Say it and internalize it. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's relive that beautiful resurrection morning. Early on Sunday morning, As the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us to the entrance of the tomb? And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the angel spoke to the women, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples. And the women ran quickly from the tomb. And they were frightened, but also filled with great joy. They rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. And we should follow that course as well. We should tell everyone what happened there because that's the only place they will ever find hope is in what Christ has done for us. That is our message to proclaim that Jesus is alive. Paul celebrated this in Corinthians when he said, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor is not in vain. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? This week, Alex Burris' little boys, Ethan and Will, had a talk. Their grandmother overheard them talking. And Ethan told Will, As his father was dying, he said, you know, when you die, you don't really die. The angels come down and they take you to heaven. (laughs) That really moves me because that's as simple as it gets. And that's what God made possible for us. A little child shall lead them. What does the resurrection shout to us? It says sin has no power over us and death does not have the final say. You don't have to walk through this life and fear the future. Christ has paid the price for us and he invites us to spend eternity with him. There was a time when I was sitting out there where you are in a service and I felt something tugging at my heart. 
It was the Holy Spirit. He was saying, you need me. And I want to come in. I want to be Lord of your life. And that may be where you are this morning. You want to give yourself to Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity to pray and ask him to come into your heart. And I want to do it right now. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And if you'll just pray this prayer sincerely with all your heart before God, I believe he will save your soul. And there are thousands of people here at Fellowship who will tell you the same. I'm going to ask those of you who are in this room and those of you who are at home, I'm going to ask you to repeat these words after me so that those who might be praying it for the first time will feel more comfortable. So let's just say this. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart right now. I believe you died on the cross for me. I know I'm a sinner. I've done wrong. I ask you to forgive my sin and cleanse me from unrighteousness. I now receive you as my Savior and I will follow you as my Lord all the days of my life. Thank you for saving me. And I encourage you, if you pray this prayer for the first time, sincerely from the bottom of your heart, tell someone, tell someone so they can help you in your walk with Christ. And I want to share a verse with you that I hope you'll write in your Bible, John 6, 47, sign your name and put the date if you pray this prayer today, where Jesus said, I tell you the truth. The one who believes will have eternal life, everlasting life. And this is all possible because of Christ and Christ alone. 